Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Earth Live lesson. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, thank you also to Lizzie Daly for inviting me to be part of this amazing initiative. It's been so great to see so many people coming together virtually, of course, um, to chat about and learn about our wonderful planet and hear some amazing stories along the way. And I'm delighted to be doing this Easter special for you today. So um, my name is Dr. Fiona Jones, and I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford in the Department of Zoology. And I'm part of the Penguin Watch team, and it's the Penguin Watch project that I'm going to be talking to you all about today. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about what we do, the background to it, what it's like to work in Antarctica, and um, crucially also how you yourselves can get involved at home as well. Um, of course, one of the great things about this being a live thing is that uh, if you have any questions along the way, then you can, of course, send those in to us. Um, so I'm going to be keeping my eye on the comments. And then at the end, if there's any questions, then I can take a look through um, those for you, of course. So penguins. Um, I should probably start this by saying that there are actually 18 different species of penguin, or at least that's what's agreed at the moment. I say that because as we learn more about the genetics of species, then, then this can actually fluctuate a bit. Um, but at the moment, there's generally agreed to be 18 different species. Um, and I've got uh, a beautiful photo here, not taken by myself, but by Sue Flood. Um, and I think this is kind of what we generally think of when we hear the word penguin. But actually, you find penguins not just in the snow and the ice, um, but all the way up to the equator, where we find the Galapagos penguins. Um, and you find small penguins living in burrows in New Zealand and Australia, those are the, the little blues. You find um, penguins on beaches in South Africa and South America, even living within tree roots um, in New Zealand, the Tawaki penguins or the field land crested penguins. Um, and so even though I myself work on Antarctic penguins and I'm going to be talking about those, it's important to remember that this is amazing diversity. Um, and of course, with all of these different penguins working, um, living in the uh, different places, it means that they're subjected to different threats. So the penguins that I work on down in Antarctica, which are the Gentoos, the Chinstraps and the Delis, um, we, we think about the threats that, that they're exposed to down in the Southern Ocean. And unfortunately, there are a few different ones, including pollution and tourism. The main two that myself and the Penguin Watch Group are focusing on are actually climate change and the krill fishing industry. So most of you are are aware of climate change and what a problem it is for the planet. Um, you might not know that the Antarctic Peninsula is actually one of the most rapidly warming places on Earth. And this isn't just a problem in terms of rising temperatures, although that in itself is. We see these um, amazing documentaries with emperor penguins huddling together and sometimes think, oh, you know, how do they do it? We feel so sorry for them because they're so cold. But that's exactly the environment that they're adapted to. And they don't actually do so well if the temperatures are warmer, things you know, that we would more enjoy. Um, so you've got uh, rising temperatures, but alongside of that, you've got changing sea ice distribution. So um, the uh, a decrease in the extent and the duration of sea ice. Um, and that's a problem for species that depend on it to breed, such as the emperor, but also other penguins like the Adelis that I work on rely on the pack ice for foraging. So that's really important. Um, and also you can get increased precipitation in the form of rain rather than snow as the climate changes in the way that it's doing. And that's important because um, when uh, chicks are born, they, they're not born with waterproof feathers. And so if they get rained on, they can get cold and get hypothermia before they've developed those adult feathers. Um, and so the climate can affect penguins in all sorts of different ways. There's also the krill fishing industry. Um, I don't know if you've heard of krill, but you've probably seen them again on some of those wildlife documentaries. Um, whales, seals, seabirds, um, they all eat krill, uh, what we call a keystone species in the Southern Ocean ecosystem because everything comes back to them. Um, so penguins um, feed on krill, they're a big part of their diet, um, but also we fish for them. And uh, that's mainly for aquaculture, so fish food, and also to make um, sort of nutraceuticals, they're called, these kind of fish oil um, tablets, which people take as health supplements. And I would really urge you not to get those because there isn't any evidence that they're any better than other fish oil tablets, um, but they could be damaging um, the Southern Ocean ecosystem. 
So we need to keep an eye on how many krill um, are fished. And this is something that's done by CAMLA, which is the part of the Antarctic Treaty that deals with the marine living resources. Um, and we don't need to just think about how many krill are fished, but also the intensity of that fishing. So if lots are taken from a small area close to, say, a penguin colony, um, that could be a problem as they're competing for these food resources. So those are two main threats in Antarctica um, that we're worried about. And one of the things that's particularly concerning for biologists like myself is these can actually work synergistically, which is just a fancy way of saying they can work together, sort of overlapping effects. Um, so one of the things that can um, happen is as we're seeing this decline in sea ice extent and duration, that's opening up new shipping routes, which people can uh, use when they bring their fishing vessels in. Um, and also krill larvae, so the young developing krill, depend on um, the sea ice for their development. They feed and aggregate on the underside of the sea ice and use it protection to, for protection and to find food. Um, so there's all these overlapping effects that um, are really difficult to tease apart. But what we want to do as part of our research group is to, to do just that, to disentangle the effects of these different threats, to be able to then mitigate them, to do something about them. Because if we know that a particular colony is doing badly because of it's exposed to intense fishing, or we know it's just because of climate change, we can begin to advise on different policies for, for example, fishing no-take zones, and marine, marine protected areas more easily and with obviously the evidence behind it that we need. But this is really challenging um, because Antarctica is famously a very hostile and remote place, very difficult to work in. And historically what's happened in terms of penguin research is that we've operated out of bases. So researchers have stayed at a particular base and then journeyed out each day um, to, to study a penguin colony, for example. And that would be great for um, you know, examining that particular colony really intensely, but what we really want to be able to do is to examine and monitor loads of different colonies um, across as much of the Southern Ocean as possible and across as many years as possible. And that's where our research comes in as part of Penguin Watch. So what we do to get around um, this problem of monitoring, because we can't possibly send biologists um, down to um, each penguin colony, unfortunately, to stay there the whole year, it wouldn't be sensible or safe or practical or financially doable or anything. Um, we get cameras to do the job for us. Um, so I'm going to try um, with my iPad to show you a few pictures. So what we do is we put up these cameras and they are time-lapse cameras. Hopefully you can see that. And you see the design is very simple. A pole basically in a big wire, you know, pile of rocks um, with a camera or two, or in this case, three, because there's a video one on there as well, on the top. So these are time-lapse. They take photos once per hour throughout the whole year. And so that acts like a kind of penguin CCTV. We can go and um, we go down to Antarctica each year during the austral summer, so our winter here in the UK. And we service these cameras, change the batteries, take the memory cards out uh, to get all that precious data um, and then leave it for the year and then go back. So in those images, we can see really crucial information. For example, when the penguins turn up to breed, when the chicks hatch, um, when the eggs are laid, and that's really important because it's not just the number of penguins that we're interested in, but things like these timings, um, the technical term for that is their phenology. Um, and if we're seeing changes in those over time, that can also be an indication that things might not be quite right. Um, so that's one of the, the things that the cameras do. While we're actually down in Antarctica, we can also use drones um, and they're better for getting an idea of the actual number of penguins um, that are in each colony. So we, we put out our time-lapse cameras but then we are also um, faced with another problem. If I show you um, our network, it stretches over the Antarctic Peninsula, the western side, up onto the Falklands, South Georgia, even to the far east, the South Sandwich Islands that aren't visited very often. Um, and there are many more cameras than what's shown on that map. So we've got about 100 and they're all taking hundreds, possibly thousands of images per year. And that leads us to a problem of having an awful lot of data to analyze. Um, we couldn't possibly just sit and look through all of these images ourselves. Uh, we couldn't possibly get through them and we'd probably be doing nothing else. Um, so what we do instead is we upload them to a citizen science project, which we launched back in 2014. Um, and that's where you come in. So just to, to give you an example, actually, of one of the pictures, um, this is kind of what they look like from in, coming from the camera. 
And then this is our site. So I would urge you, if you're all uh, at home, um, you know, staying home to save lives, please uh, go onto our citizen science website and get involved. So what happens on the website is you're presented with one of our images. And then we simply ask you to click on the penguins in the images so that we can count them and build up these time series to see what's going on. So you're asked to tag the image as either an adult, a chick, an egg or other. An other could be um, a tourist, maybe a different animal. So perhaps a skewer attacking a chick or something like that. Um, and then you literally have to click on the penguins in the images. And it's very addictive. And we take all of those clicks. None of them are eliminated. Um, we average them to make sure that any mistakes um, are avoided. And uh, that, that really helps us with our research. And since 2014, we've had over six and a half million images classified in this way. So that's fantastic for us um, and something that we're really proud of. And we just love that how much people enjoy clicking on penguins and images. Um, it's fantastic. And as I say, we really couldn't do our research without it. Um, so people often ask us, can you not just use like machine learning or computer vision um, to help us um, to do this? And the answer is that we do. So we have a penguin counting algorithm called PengBot. Nice name. Um, and this is the kind of thing it does. It looks for penguin pixels in images and then looks at the density of those pixels to work out how many penguins are in the image. And what it means by using both of these things, citizen science and machine learning, is we can use both of them together to get the best results possible. So um, we'll always need the citizen science. It's so great to have that human input. Um, humans are great at spotting things computers can't. They're also needed to train algorithms like this. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're really good at also seeing things. We've got talk forums um, on Penguin Watch and people will flag up unusual behaviors and interesting things that they've seen um, and that's really fantastic and helps with our knowledge as well so um, yeah please do get involved and help us to, to tag penguins and work out what's going on with the populations um, in terms of what we're finding um, we are we are seeing declines in certain species on the Antarctic Peninsula which is one of the main places where we work um, but we're also seeing um, differences between the species. There are winners and losers when it comes to climate change. And Gen 2 penguins actually seem to be doing quite well. And they're moving southward down the peninsula as it warms. So much like we sometimes hear here in the UK about butterflies migrating north as it warms um, further north. Down in Antarctica, we're seeing the opposite effect at the bottom of the world, where Gen 2s are moving southward and actually sometimes displacing some of the other species. And the reason they're able to do that is they're what we call a generalist species. And that means um, that they're not so worried really about what they eat. They will eat the krill that I was talking about earlier that was so important, but they can also switch their diet quite easily to something like silverfish. Um, and they're also not very dependent. Um, they, they don't need the sea ice in the same way that the Adelis and the chinstrap penguins do. So we're seeing a, an increase in the gentoos and a decline in the adelis and the chin straps, very broadly speaking. Um, so those are some of the main things that we found. Do send any questions in um, if you have them. And just to carry on uh, with the images, I've been very fortunate um, with what I do. Um, being able to go down to Antarctica. I've been down for the last four seasons. And the way that we get around is um, we like to describe ourselves as Southern Ocean hitchhikers. So we travel around basically using ships that are there anyway, um, whatever we can do. Oh, somebody said happy Easter from Wales. Happy Easter, Simon. I hope you're having a good day. Please do stay, learn about penguins, send over any penguin related questions you might have. Um, so we use these ships that are there. And, and that's great because if, um, earlier I was saying about if we just work and operate out of a base, then we're limited about where we can go geographically. If we jump onto a ship, then we can travel around, get out onto land when we need to, um, work on the colony and then get back onto the ship. So that's how we operate most of the time. Um, I've been very fortunate to go on um, a couple of longer expeditions. Last year, I was fortunate enough to go and see emperors. And that was what my um, the thumbnail of this YouTube um, video is. And that was somewhere called Snow Hill Island, which is actually on the peninsula. So emperor penguins breed on the sea ice. They're the only penguin species to breed in the cold and bleak Antarctic winter. Um, 
And that meant that we had to go on our expedition a bit earlier than usual. This was taken back in October. And what we did there was we took some um, aerial footage to see how the colonies are doing. So this is one of the drone images that we took. So you can see all of those little black dots just there. And uh, you can kind of imagine how that sort of image would lend itself quite well to a machine learning algorithm that was able to count those dots. Um, so that was what we were, were doing there, censusing the population, seeing how they were doing. Um, and in that same season, I was lucky enough to, to go camping. Um, that was something that I thought I would never do, camping in Antarctica. So here is me in my um, snowy home for about five days. Um, so the idea of that, that camping expedition was to spend a bit longer with a colony because it's really great to be able to go and get this breadth um, of data that we do from geographic locations. Um, but it's also nice to be able to observe them a little bit more intensely. Um, so we took our drone, set up camp there for a few days. Unfortunately, the weather was terrible. Um, it was exceptionally windy. Um, so there was only one or two days that we could actually fly the drone. Um, but uh, we could take guano samples as well. That's something else that we do. I myself am not a geneticist, um, but it's really important um, when you're working in somewhere like Antarctica that is such um, a difficult place to get to, to be collaborative with other scientists. Um, so what we do um, is we basically see, does anyone need some samples while we're there? And there are researchers working at um, Oxford University, Louisiana State, Stony Brook, many different places. Um, and, uh, and so we take guano samples so that they can look at things like um, isotope data, so where penguins are fishing, also looking at the parasites in the guano. Um, so that's the glamorous bit of the job, um, collecting gu uh, penguin guano. Um, so, so that was what we did while we were camping, and uh, that was a, a brilliant opportunity. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. That's really what I was going to talk to you about, the importance of um, why we're doing this research, to see what's going on with the populations, um, and, uh, and really that you can get involved, and it would be fantastic if you do. It's also part of a citizen science platform called Zooniverse, um, which I cannot recommend enough. There's roughly a hundred projects on there. And they're not even all just science projects. You can transcribe old literature um, to help historical studies. You can look at um, old climate records. You can do all sorts of things on there. Um, so that's zooniverse.org and penguinwatch.org is part of that. Um, Annette is asking, have we already planned our next penguin expedition? And the answer to that is yes. Um, people are always quite astonished when we, um, we're we sitting there in June uh, in the sunshine, like we're lucky enough to have today. and Obviously, not at the moment are we meeting, but uh, but normally we'd be getting together and thinking about our next expedition. So yes, we've we've thought about the dates that we will go that we will be going on, the team that will be going, the sites that we hope to reach. Starting to think about um, the logistics of how the schedule will all come together, um, because as you can imagine, it's not just somewhere that you pop off to. There's lots of things to think about in terms of the kit that you wear and how you get there. Um, so we fly to Buenos Aires in Argentina and then down to the support town of Ushuaia and we sail from there. Um, and it's about roughly two days sailing across the Drake Passage, um, which is one of the roughest seas in the world. Um, and so it can sometimes be quite an uncomfortable journey, but of course it's worth it to get there in the end. And uh, people say you kind of have to do that journey to pay your way to, to be able to see the amazing landscape when you get there and all the incredible wildlife and scenery. Um, so, so yes, we have started planning. Of course, we're a little bit um, up in the air of what might happen um, with the, the situation that we're currently in, um, in terms of travel and all that kind of thing. But, you know, we have to keep planning and, and see what happens. Um, so, yes, I don't know if there are any other questions. Could be about penguins generally. Um, doesn't have to be about Penguin Watch or about what it's like to work in Antarctica or to, to work in science. I would just strongly encourage anybody who has a curiosity in science, the natural world, discovering new things, um, to, to just keep on going with that. And um, it's, it's such an incredible thing to do. People are always amazed at the amount of travel that you get to do as a scientist, whether that's to a country or, um, you know, as I'm fortunate enough to do, to go to on field work. Um, are there any penguins that live in warm areas? Yes, yes, there are. So there are penguins that live all the way up to the equator. And if you want to, um, a sneaky quiz question, there are quite a few virtual quizzes going on at the moment. 
you can find some penguins north of the equator, which people don't often realise, because those Galapagos penguins that live right up there in often actually cross the equator. Uh, so they don't go very far north. Um, but yeah, they're in warm areas. They have different adaptations. Um, so they they have larger um, sort of uh, flippers, which gives them um, more surface area for to be losing heat from. They have... Um, they actually even walk in a different way. I don't think that's an adaptation to the heat, but you can see an Antarctic penguin because it carries its flippers behind it when it's walking uh, rather than in front. Uh, so yes, very much in the warm in South America, South Africa, Australia. Um, in Australia, like I said, right back at the start, for those who are here, they live in sandy burrows. Um, in the Falklands, the Magellanics live underneath big tufts of grass. So yeah, they're really not just penguins living out in the snow and the ice and the cold, like we always imagine. Um, someone said, can penguins be domesticated? Um, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Of course, it's very contentious whether we should have any animals in zoos. Um, there are pros and cons, of course, conservation efforts, but also they have to be kept appropriately and in good condition. Um, yes, you wouldn't want to be keeping Antarctic penguins in temperate conditions by any means. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't keep one as a pet. No, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> For us, yeah, it would be bad for the penguin, but also bad for you. Um, it would be very smelly. They are very smelly, um, particularly um, in warmer conditions. And uh, they would need a lot of space and a lot of water for swimming in, because it's really important to remember that while we often see penguins in cartoons waddling along on the land, they're really not land animals. They're marine birds. They're amazing marine predators. They're extremely graceful um, diving through the water. They're ambush predators. They dive in and then they um, propel upwards underneath their prey to catch them. Um, so, yeah, don't keep a penguin as a pet. That wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> I'm wondering if that's a good note to finish on. I should definitely leave you with the, the URL for Penguin Watch on. I'm aware that my 20 minutes has gone very quickly. Um, so... Let me find it's penguinwatch.org. So if you just type Penguin Watch into um, your browser as well, it will come up. And it's great. Anyone up from the age of five can take part. And uh, yeah, we look forward to working with you. And stay safe and happy. Have a very happy Easter, everybody. And if anybody has any more questions, then please just do drop them in the comments. Oh, Somebody, uh, Annette has asked, just before I go, if I have a favourite fiction book on penguins. Um, oh, I don't know if I have a favourite fiction book. Happy Feet is pretty good. I know that's a film. Um, and then I, I love um, some of these photography books are amazing. I haven't been told to plug any of these, um, but I've got this beautiful book on Empress by Sue Flood, and I was lucky enough to travel with her once um, and to see her taking pictures is amazing. Um and uh, yeah, I think uh, also I just really like those old sort of explorer stories of working in Antarctica. Um, sort of one of my um, favourite stories, if I've just got a couple of minutes, Lizzie can jump in if I'm going over too much. Um, there were two, two people called Thomas Bagshaw and Maxine Lester, and they were part of a um, British imperial expedition um, to Antarctica back in 1920. And this was meant to be a really grand expedition. They were meant to do a circumnavigation of Antarctica, a flight over the pole. They were meant to go and explore more of the eastern side of the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's the Weddell Sea um, and uh, explore more of the, the area that um, someone called Nordenschuld had started to explore previously. Um, and it was meant to be with 50 men, huge budget. Um, but then basically their budget got cut. And when they got down to Antarctica, it was four men and a boat. And two of those men, the, the leader, um, John Cope, and his second in command, um, George Hubert Wilkins, left the expedition, leaving just Bagshaw um, and, and um, uh, oh no, and Lester. And, uh, and so they stayed. And instead of just sort of giving up, they said, you know what, we're down in Antarctica, we're going to do some science. And they stayed and they made tidal observations, meteorological observations, um, and they were doing those hourly, so really high frequency um, data collection. And even though neither of them were biologists, um, they decided to make some notes on the penguins that were surrounding them um, because they were really fascinated by them. Um, and actually, it probably helped that they weren't experts. They were amateurs, which meant that they weren't biased when they were making their notes about observations. And so we have these hourly notes of how many penguins were there, when the 
eggs were laid, when the chicks hatched. And that's really what we're trying to emulate um, with what we're doing, but without their terrible conditions. They were there for a whole year. So even through the Antarctic winter, in an upturned old water boat that had been left there eight years previously. And we now call that part of Antarctica on the peninsula water boat point because of them staying there. Um, so really that's what we're trying to emulate, as I say, that kind of high frequency observation, really good data, um, but without having to put ourselves in those kind of conditions. We can stay nice and comfy on a ship or, or sometimes in a tent. Um, and that's really brilliant. So, so that's just a little story um, about uh, not a fiction story, um, a, uh, a real thing that happened, which is one of my favourite stories involving penguins. Um, so, and just to say, um, she says her favourite book is Lost and Found by Oliver Jeffers, which is an excellent book and has been recommended to me by many people as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions and for listening. And if anybody has any more, then just drop them in the comments because I can go back to this video and I'd be happy to reply to them. Um, but it's been lovely to talk to you and thank you very much and happy Easter. <laughs>